All right, so good morning, everybody. Our fellowship as of recently has been uh, talking about the subject of Christology, which is the study of the person and significance of Jesus. We've also been talking about who is God and the person and significance of God. Of course, some people think that those are one and the same conversations. Um, but we've demonstrated, I think, pretty thoroughly that uh, the Father is the only true God and Jesus is the Son of God. And this is not something that all people who claim to be Christians agree upon. And so uh, today we wanted to talk about how we can uh, strategize in talking to other people about these important topics. So let's go ahead and share. Okay. Okay. Um, can you see the normal screen in front of you? Thumbs up. Everything looks good. It's too large. Uh, you need to reduce it a little bit. The format. I'm not sure what you mean. It's too large. Well, we not. It's pretty large on there, Dustin. We're not seeing the whole screen. There you go. Um, okay, give me a second. There you go. That's it. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Thanks for that. All right, <clears throat> so today we'll talk about uh, tips for sharing the one God and the human Jesus with others. And uh, there's a variety of things that you can talk about in regard to this, but these are just some particular tips that I have found to be useful um, uh, in various conversations and various uh, talks around a table at a Starbucks or within pastoral ministry to have conversations with other people who think and believe differently about God and think and believe differently about who Jesus is. So uh, obviously you can't be comprehensive with this, but uh, hopefully this encourages you with a couple of things to consider. This is going to be more of a practical teaching and, and not so much a, a doctrine type teaching, but I think we kind of have to start off and ask the question, why, sh why should we bother sharing the one God and the human Jesus? Uh, there are some people that think that that is just really not their responsibility or it's not really that important. Maybe we don't need to bother other people or we don't need to create any sort of drama by talking about something that is controversial. Uh, it's very clear. I mean, uh, the person of God and, and Jesus, they're probably the two most controversial persons in the history of the world. Um, and so obviously they're important and significant for people. Okay, so reason number one, um, God's heart is that his people would come to know what is true, especially in regard to who God is and who Jesus is. So 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 5 says, talks about God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then he tells us that truth that he wants us to come to know. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men. And that mediator is defined as the man, Christ Jesus. Okay. Uh, and so here, this is what God wants. God desires, he wishes, he wills that people will come to the knowledge of the truth. This is what God wants. Okay. And that tells us that particular truth that God wants people to know. So why should we bother to share this? Well, it's because God cares about it. So we should care about it. That's reason number one. Number two, Jesus summons us to continue in the ministry that he started. So the last verses of Matthew 28 has Jesus command us and say, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. We are to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we are to teach them to observe all that I commanded you. Okay, so Jesus tells us that we need to continue his ministry as making disciples Part of making disciples is to teach them to observe or to obey everything that Jesus commanded. Okay? So why should we bother sharing the one God and the human Jesus? Because Jesus shared the one God and Jesus talked about himself. And he commands us to make disciples and to carry out his ministry. 
specifically by teaching other people to observe the things that Jesus taught. Number three, the Apostle Paul recognized the need for correct knowledge of the Messiah to go along with fervent zeal. He says this in Romans 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them, this is for the Jews that are not Christians, my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Romans 10 verses 1 through 2. So Paul says it's possible for people to be religious, for people to have a relationship with God and to have a zeal, a, a passion, a, a fervent uh, zeal for God, but have incorrect knowledge. Okay? And notice there that without the correct knowledge, Paul is assuming that they do not have salvation. Okay? Uh, and so, it's again, it's possible to be – I mean, there's lots of people out there that are really, really religious and really, really excited about their understanding of God. But without the correct knowledge – I mean, Paul's, Paul is praying for these people. So why should we bother sharing the one God and the human Jesus? Uh, because we need to have correct knowledge to go with fervent zeal. And number four, uh, we want others, or we would want others to share truth with us if we were misguided, okay? And I'm taking this from what is generally called the golden rule uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 12, Jesus says, in everything, therefore, Treat people the same way you want them to treat you, okay? Treat people the same way you want them to treat you. So if I would want someone to come along and to help me if I was misguided, and I want to, to treat other people the way that I want them to treat me, then I should also want to share truth with others who are misguided, okay? So why should we bother sharing the one God and the human Jesus? because I would want someone to share those things with me if I was confused or in the dark, okay? So there are some biblical reasons from God, Jesus, Paul, and the Sermon on the Mount for why we should do these things, okay? Uh, I think those are some very strong reasons, and uh, I hope that, um, that you find them persuasive, okay? So things that we need to keep in mind when we are talking to others. Okay, uh, number one, uh, most Christians have not given much thought to the theology of their local church or their upbringing. Since this is likely the case, we need to encourage them to deeply think about God and Jesus, which are hardly unimportant topics for Christians to critically consider. Okay, uh, there are a lot of people that just accept what they're taught in church because we generally accept religious people that are placed before us. Maybe we have just accepted what our parents tell us because it's natural for children to have an accepting relationship with their parents. Um, but not a lot of people have taken the time to really critically examine if what they have been taught is true. Um, you know, the latest uh, sociological polls indicate that there are around 30,000 different distinct Christian denominations. That's 30,000, three with four zeros at the end of it. That's 30,000 distinct Christian groups that believe something different from the group next to them, okay? So how do you know if the group that you were born into is correct? It would be pretty arrogant to think that what I was born into must be correct and everyone else is wrong because that's kind of implicitly what everyone else thinks. So, um, I mean, the likelihood is that <laughs> one out of a, a 30,000 chance uh, is not a very, those aren't very good odds. So um, I think, First thing we could do is we could just encourage other people like, hey, ha have you thought about God? Have you thought about Jesus? Have you thought critically about who they are and what is the distinction between them and what is the relationship between the two of them about the identity of God and the identity of Jesus? People are very interested in thinking critically about social issues and about police reform and about uh, racial issues. And, you know, people want to think about important things that matter to people's lives what more important than the persons of God and Jesus? So I think you could do that, that you can encourage people to think about those things. Number two, when it comes to major topics like the definition of God and Christology, people need time to process new truths and new data. I'm gonna say that again. People need time 
to process new truths and new data. This could take weeks, it could take months. And so we need to strike a balance between regularly checking in on those we talk to and giving them space to process, okay? Now I've known some people that when I talk about this particular balance of, hey, you, you gotta, you gotta regularly feed into these people, but you also gotta, you gotta give them some time and some space to process. I know some people that will focus only on one to the neglect of the other, and it doesn't generally uh, lead to positive outcomes, okay? So if all you do is badger somebody um, and you just, just check in like every single day, you're just, you're just say, you know, what about this first? What about this first? What about this first? Um, it's, it's like you're, you're force feeding them. You know, like people, they, they need time to, to, to accept something in their own mind, okay? On the other hand, there are some people that say, hey, I'm just going to talk about God and Jesus once and I'm going to plant a seed and then I'm never going to talk to them again. And then it's just kind of up to them. And they just give them all the space to process, but they never check in on them. They never ask them how they're doing. They don't say, hey, do you have any questions or have you thought about this more or hold them accountable? Um, I don't think that's good either. Um, so I think a balance between, again, as, as a disciple, you're, you're regularly feeding into somebody, but we have to respect that, you know what? It takes time for people to process these things, okay? Uh, and I've noticed that. I've noticed that uh, like going for a hard sell, saying, look, this is the way it is, um, and expecting them to change on the spot. Generally speaking, it, it has happened, but generally speaking, people need time to, to, to be convinced themselves. And once they're convinced themselves, then they're good to go, okay? Uh, number three, we need to learn to discern when someone is unwilling to listen to you. Okay, we need to learn to discern when someone is unwilling to listen to you. Now, God gives everybody free will, and we need to respect that. And if someone does not want to listen to your well-intentioned attempt at speaking truth and love, then we should not force a confrontation, okay? Um, if you just begin talking to somebody and it becomes clear that, you know what? They have no interest in, in hearing what you have to say, or they're just going to refuse to listen, or, or they just don't want anyone else. I mean, they are convinced that they're right and everyone else is wrong. Um, okay, God gives them free will. God is going to respect that. We need to respect that as well. Um, and, if, and trust me, if someone does not want to listen, if someone doesn't want to have a conversation, forcing a conversation is not the loving thing to do, okay? There's plenty of other people out in the world. There's what, 7 billion people out in the world, and not everyone understands God and Jesus. Take that time and that energy and find someone else to talk to. There are plenty of people out there in the world that, are, are, that, that, that don't want to be wrong about God. They want, they want to be right. They don't want to be confused. They don't want to live in error, and they would love for someone to come and to help them understand the Bible. Find those people and, and, and focus on them. But if someone, does, if someone just doesn't want to listen to you, then don't force it, okay? Respect the free will that God has given them. Number four, a very important one here. We've got to take the time to really listen to what your dialogue partner thinks and believes. Don't assume they believe X unless they tell you, okay? I've, I've met a lot of people that go to churches that – you know, their statement of faith of the church is that they believe in the Trinity, but when you talk to that particular person, it's clear that that's not what they believe. And if I'm just to assume that they believe that, then, you know, I'm, I'm really unfairly judging them. I'm not allowing them to speak, and I'm not listening to them. Uh, James chapter 1 tells us that we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Uh, you know, we can't just assume that people, if they believe differently from us, then they believe in the Trinity. That's just not true. There are, I think, what, like six or seven million Jehovah's Witnesses that don't believe in the Trinity. If a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, don't talk to them about the Trinity. That's not what they believe. Okay, you can't assume that. So you got, you, it's, it's helpful to ask somebody, ask these helpful questions, what do they believe? You know, because they might believe something different than what their own church says. And you don't want to judge people by what their church says. You need to judge them by what they say. All right. And number five, uh, I'm just calling this the, the three C's. We need to remember the three C's of we need to have courage, 
we need to have conviction and we need to have compassion. Okay. Um, you you got to have the courage to, to go up and to have a conversation with somebody. Okay. You can't live in fear. You can't live in anxiety. I mean, if, if Jesus did not have the courage to preach the gospel to people, we would not have 12 disciples. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that would happen. Uh, you got to have conviction. You got to have conviction that, you know what? God and Christ are important topics that deserve to be discussed. And the conviction that God wants people to know the truth. And Jesus wants us to disciple people to uh, adopt Jesus' teachings. And that Paul believes we need to have knowledge to go with zeal. Um, you you got to have some conviction. In, in what you're saying. Otherwise, you're, you're not going to be very successful. And of course, you have to have compassion. You have to love the person um, in order to speak truth to them. You have to love them to listen to what they have to say. You have to love them to, to give them the, the time to process these things. Um, and, you know, if, if it comes down to it, you have to love them to tell them that they might be making a terrible mistake. Okay. If there is, you know, I can look out my window right here and there's a road. Okay. If there's a little child playing in the middle of the road and there's a car coming and that child doesn't see it, um, the compassionate thing for me to do is to loudly warn the child that, that doom is coming so that they can save themselves. Okay. Um, people tend to think that compassion and conviction and courage don't mix well together. That's just the misunderstanding of compassion. Okay. You got to have all those things. Okay, a few facts that you can share in order to break the ice, okay? So these, just a couple of facts that you might wanna have handy when you wanna have these particular conversations. There are thousands of facts you could have, but I, I thought that these might be some that would be useful to you, okay? Um, first fact, uh, this is something that actually is, is really convicting to me. Um, God, in a variety of ways, is mentioned over 12,000 times in the Bible, and he is never once equated to the number three. 12,000 times God reveals himself, never once is he equated to the number three. You could do a, a word study, closest thing you're going to find to God in three being uh, detailed in scripture is the repeated truth that, quote, God raised Jesus on the third day. Like I said, you could do a, you could do a, a Bible work study, a concordance study, with, with the word God or various words for God, whether it's, it's Elohim or Yahweh or Adonai, uh, Almighty or Theos or, or even the Father. And the closest thing you're going to get is God raised Jesus on the third day. Okay? So, so God is revealed 12,000 times in the Bible and never once is he described as being three. You would think if, if the Trinity is the true doctrine that God would reveal himself as three or equated with the number three, at least somewhere in the Bible. But never, not in a single occurrence, not in one single verse. That's very interesting. That's very telling for me. Okay. Um, second fact, Jesus, by the way, is called a human being more times in the gospel of John than in Matthew, Mark, and Luke combined. Why is that important? Okay. Because people have been told that the gospel of John has a higher Christology than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay, and yet the Gospel of John argues for the humanity of Jesus stronger and more emphatically than Matthew, than Mark, and Luke, and actually all three of them combined. I think that's very interesting. Number three, you could tell people that Trinitarian theology was not invented until 381. And even then, it was strongly disputed by many church leaders. There were no Trinitarians in the first century. There were no Trinitarians in the second century, and there were no Trinitarians in the third century. It wasn't until like 350 years after the resurrection of Jesus, that people started to write this stuff out and make a uh, Christian doctrine out of it. And even then it was disputed. Number four, Jews in the second temple period believed that the Messiah preexisted in God's mind, plans, and purposes. There are, a variety, there are dozens and dozens of, te of texts to demonstrate this words from Jews, both inside and outside the Bible, in biblical and extra-biblical texts to demonstrate that this is how they understood the pre-existence of the Messiah. It was in God's mind, God's plans, and God's purposes. Number five, the Holy Spirit is never the object of worship in the Bible, but God and Jesus are, okay? No one ever worships the Holy Spirit. No one ever sings a song to the Holy Spirit. You might hear 
songs in Christian radio today where people sing to the Holy Spirit, okay? But that is not a biblical way of worshiping, okay? Furthermore, the Holy Spirit is never portrayed as sending greetings in the New Testament epistles, but God and Jesus are. So Paul will write uh, a letter and he'll say, grace and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's no separate third person that is sending greetings, okay? Holy Spirit's never worshiped. Holy Spirit never sends greetings, okay? That, that's enough to kind of get people to really question the, uh, the, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit being a conscious third person. Uh, number six, Jesus personally refers to God as my God 10 times in the New Testament, okay? And most of those occurrences are actually after his resurrection, so we got occurrences before his resurrection and occurrences after his resurrection. So Jesus says, my God, 10 times. That's what he, 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 so how could Jesus be the almighty God if he has a God above him? That's a very strong point. No matter what exalted things you want to say about Jesus, Jesus still has a God above him. And number seven, the writers of the New Testament refer to Jesus as the descendant of King David 20 times. Okay, Jesus is a descendant of David. Why is that important? Why do I keep harping on this particular point? Okay, because if you are the descendant of David, then that means you're a human being who is younger than David. It means you don't exist prior to David. Okay, my dad's name is Brett. I am a descendant of Brett. Okay, it means that I share um, the, the humanity that I got from him, and I'm not older than my dad, okay? No son is older than his father, ever. Point me to one. Where is it, okay? No son is the same age as his father. If so, where? Point me to him, okay? So the fact that the New Testament repeatedly describes Jesus as a descendant of King David implies he is a human being that descends from a famous line of kings. Okay, the importance of the Bible in discussions about God and Jesus. Now, you might think that this is pretty obvious. Like, obviously, come on, Dustin. Like, the Bible is obviously important, okay? But you might find for a lot of people that when they have discussions that it's really a lot of just opinions. It's just, this is what my church says, or this is what I feel, or this is what I think. Or there are some people that just say, this is what I believe, as if what one particular person confesses to believe uh, is the standard for truth. And you know what? We all might feel and think and believe different things. But we got to have a foundation. And most people think that the Bible should be the foundation. So we got to spur people to get into the Bible when things start to become subjective. Too quickly, things can turn into a lengthy conversation filled with, I believe that, or I feel that, or I think that. The best thing you can do when things get like this is to have all parties with their own Bible opened up, okay? So you have everyone there, like you see in the picture, okay? Everyone there, sitting there the Bible, opened up, they're able to read the passages for themselves, okay? So, um, you can actually respond to their, I believe that, with, well, the Bible says this right here, okay? Because, you know, it's, respectfully, it doesn't really matter what you believe if the Bible says something different, okay? And, of course, we want to believe what the Bible says. I think most people want to believe what is true. So if we can agree that the Bible is the foundation, then that has to be the starting place, not just our, our thoughts and our feelings and our beliefs. I'm not saying those aren't important, but, you know, they, they can't be the final word on things. Number two, never underestimate the power of having your dialogue partner read aloud the verses you want them to take seriously, okay? I, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. This is a really, really powerful tool um, because sometimes just getting someone to look at the words and say them out loud is enough to have them reconsider their position, okay? And I've, about this example that I'm giving you, I've actually done multiple times um, in various places that I've lived, okay? If the Jehovah's Witnesses are at your home and you want them to come to see that the risen Jesus is a human being and not an archangel, you need to have them read the passages in the New Testament that talk about the resurrected Jesus as a human being, which are Romans 5.15, Acts 17.30-31, and 1 Timothy 2.4-5, okay? 
Um, I don't know if you knew that. Did you know that, that the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the resurrected Jesus is not a man? He is back to being Michael the Archangel. Actually, you could also read uh, 1 Corinthians 15, which says that uh, Jesus is the, uh, um, the last Adam. Okay. Um, but, you, you know, this, the thing is, I can, I can tell them that, but whenever I have them over into my home, um, which is tons of fun, I should record it next time. You'd love it. Um, you you want to get them to read these things because when you get someone else to read something, it's like they have, they have to, to read the words. They have to think about what they're saying. They have to say it out loud and try to figure out what in the world that means. Okay. And it forces them to come to reality with something that they might not have been taught or that contradicts their own position. So if you're, my, my, my tip with you is that if you're having these discussions with people and you want them to see something, don't read them a verse. Ask them to read the verse for you. You know what the verse says, but get them to read it. It's subtle, but it's really, really helpful, and I would encourage you to try it out. Number three, see if you can get your dialogue partner to agree that the Bible will always trump church teachings, thus creating a foundation for discussion, okay? Um, we might all agree that this is the case, but that's not what everyone thinks, okay? Like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe that the teachings of their church are what, what is the standard, okay? Or the Mormons, they believe that the teachings of the Mormon church and of Joseph Smith, they are a standard in addition to the Bible, okay? Um, there's some people that just think that uh, uh, the, the teachings of the Catholic church, those are the, the, the standard, okay? There are a lot of people that just think that the teaching of their favorite teacher or potentially a, a, a former cult leader, um, that, that is their standard. People will say, I hear a lot of people say, well, that's what I was taught. That's what I was taught. They'll repeat that to me. That's what I was taught. And I'm thinking, okay, but that's not the standard. The standard is what the Bible says. Um, you know, so we, we got to make sure that we have that, uh, that point uh, in agreement because, because people think that they're teaching something from the Bible, but we have to make sure that we're all on the same page with those things. So just have that conversation with them, encourage them to, uh, to say, okay, what, what is our standard? What is the point that find something we can agree on? What is some solid ground upon which we can build conversations? Okay. Um, letting the simple passages speak before the difficult ones. Okay. Now, you don't start learning calculus before basic addition and subtraction. So, why begin to debate the difficult passages before you would discuss the easy ones? Okay? So, by starting with the simple, straightforward verses, you can develop common ground with your dialogue partner. Okay? So this is important because if, if your conversation is going to be something that goes on for a long time, if it goes on for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, find something in common. Find something we can agree on. Okay, let's, let's start with some basic verses. Yeah, there are difficult verses in the Bible. I'm not going to say that they aren't, okay? We've tried to address those in a variety of our teachings, okay? But you don't start with calculus. You start with the basics, okay? The basics are things we can all agree on, and then we can build on from our basic points of agreement. So take, for example the passages dealing with the hierarchy between God and Jesus, okay? I found this tactic to be um, really successful, and, and you might find this to be um, beneficial to you in your conversations as well, okay? So take passages that deal with the hierarchy between God and Jesus. So Jesus said, the Father is greater than I, John 14, 28. Paul says, you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God, okay? So that's pretty clear. God at the top, Jesus number two. And you, second person plural, you all belong to Christ, 1 Corinthians 3.23. How about this one, 1 Corinthians 11.3? Paul says, I want you to understand, I want you to understand Christ is the head of every husband, the husband is the head of the wife, and God is the head of Christ. Okay, this is what Paul wants us to understand. God is at top, Christ, the risen and exalted Christ, is number two. And then you have the husband and the wife, okay? So he gives that hierarchy there. This is what Paul wants his converts to understand. God is the head of Christ. And we've already read this passage, 1 Timothy 2, 5. There is one God and a mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So you got God at the top. You've got the mediator between humanity and God. And that mediator is a human being, the man Christ Jesus. So what I've found is that you can actually make a helpful visual aid 
for verses like this, okay? So you read these passages, or better yet, get your dialogue partner to read them for you, and just write them out on a piece of paper. So I've done something like this, okay? So you've got this hierarchy, John 14, 28. You've got God the Father. The Father is greater than I. So God on top, Jesus, and the place below that. 1 Corinthians 3, 23. Um, God is at top. God is the head of Christ. And uh, then we have you all on, on, in third place. 1 Corinthians eleven three. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the husband. The husband is the head of the wife. And 1 Timothy 2, 5, you've got God. You've got the mediator, which is the man, Christ Jesus. And then you have humanity in the third place. So, so look at all these verses here. I said, is, is Jesus co-equal with God? Is Jesus co-equal with the Father? No. Jesus is clearly the second place person. Okay, is, is Jesus called God? No, Jesus is distinguished from God. Okay, God is a separate person who has a separate rank from Jesus. Okay, who is God? God is described as the Father. Who is Jesus? Jesus is described as a human being. Okay, and, and just pointing that out there. It might be helpful for you. Okay, it's worked for me might be helpful for you. So it's good to commit those four passages to memory. Okay, um, here's a possible strategy based on Paul's evangelism. And, and we can talk about a dozen strategies. We can talk about a hundred strategies, but um, here is one that kind of frames it from looking at a blank slate on how Paul interacted with most of the people um, with whom he preached the gospel. So as the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul evangelized pagans hundreds of times in multiple cities all over the Roman Empire. It is interesting to see how Paul converted those persons who were used to worshiping many gods and many lords in favor of the God of Israel and the Jewish Messiah. So consider these passages. Acts 17, 30-31. Paul says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance... God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Why should they repent? Because he, that's God, has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Okay? So, this is how Paul would preach to Gentiles, okay? Hey, there's one God, okay? He is going to judge the world, and in the Bible, to judge the world means to rule the world, okay? We have a book of judges, and the judges were earthly rulers. Jesus says that we're going to judge um, judge the world, means we're going to rule the world. He has fixed a day in which God is going to rule the world through a man whom he's appointed by raising him from the dead, okay? So we've got the death and resurrection of Jesus. We've got the fact that Jesus is a human being. Jesus is going to judge and rule the world. And God has fixed a day in which this is going to happen. What a, what a great presentation of the gospel. you got the death and resurrection of Jesus, the identity of him as a man that God has appointed, the fact that he is distinct from God, and you've got the kingdom of God there where Jesus is going to come back and judge and rule the world righteously. Okay, and people should repent because of that. All right, so when Paul preached the gospel, it was about one God and one man, Jesus. Jesus is the one that died and rose, and Jesus is the one that's come back to judge and rule the world in God's kingdom. And people should repent because of it. Here's another one, First Thessalonians. Uh, Paul says, For they themselves report about, about us what kind of reception we had with you, and how, notice very careful here, how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 10, okay? So again, these, these pagans, these Gentiles, they worshiped idols. They had to turn from idols to God. And this God is called the living and true God. And guess what? This living and true God, he has a son, someone distinct from the living and true God. Who is that son? That son is Jesus. Jesus died. God raised Jesus from the dead. And Jesus is going to come back and rescue us from the wrath of judgment. Okay? So, you know, again, as we can see, Paul preached a single God and his human son, Jesus, who is coming to judge the world and to rescue the faithful from wrath. Okay? Paul did not preach that God is a trinity. Okay? Paul did not preach 
the doctrine of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit being co-equal, co-eternal, and co-essential. Paul did not preach that God became a man. And for my Jehovah's Witness friends, Paul did not preach that Michael the Archangel became a man. Okay? Paul preached that Jesus is a human being. Jesus is God's son, and there's only one God. Jesus died. Jesus was mortal. And it was God who raised Jesus from the dead. And preached the kingdom. Jesus is coming back to judge and rule the world and to rescue the faithful from the wrath to come. And because of this, we need to repent. Okay? So this might be a strategy for you. You could just kind of point out and say, look, this is what Paul preached. Uh, and you can ask your, your dialogue partner, is, is this what, what you received? Is this the sort of message that you have? Is it, and you, maybe you can ask them, how would you preach God and Jesus to the people? Does it sound like the preaching of Paul? Very interesting. Okay. Who was Jesus according to Paul's gospel? Here is another possible strategy. Since Paul had to explain the person significance of Jesus to Gentiles who had little to no prior knowledge, of Judaism's messianism, it is quite telling to see how Jesus is defined in these gospel presentations, okay? So the logic of this is that Paul is preaching to these Gentiles who don't know anything about Jewish messianic expectations, okay? So they don't know, Paul can't say, hey, you need to believe in the Messiah because they don't even know what the Messiah is. It's not even a word in the vocabulary, okay? So, so what did Paul have to say to these people that worshipped lots of gods, lots of lords? They worshipped the Roman emperor, and they worshipped Zeus, and they worshipped Apollo. What did Paul have to say to them about Jesus? Because he had to explain who Jesus was literally from the ground up. Opening five verses of Romans. I like this one. Paul says, uh, he describes himself as a bondservant of Christ. Christ Jesus called him as apostle. Uh, set apart for the gospel of God, okay? And he's going to define what the gospel of God is, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared to be son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness. Who is this? Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. And that's a lot. Hey, Paul, you gotta, we got to work on your run-on sentences, okay? But he defines what the gospel is. It's God's gospel. And guess what? It's about God's son, someone distinct from God. Who is that son? He was born, okay? He was born as a descendant of David, okay? Which means that he was of the line of David's kings, he has promised the throne of David. He has promised David's kingdom. Okay, He's a human being just like David was. He didn't pre-exist David. He's not David's creator. Okay, And he is powerfully declared to be the son of God at the resurrection of the dead. So Jesus died. He was raised from the dead. Okay, And there's something involved with the spirit of holiness with Jesus right now. He is described as our Lord, meaning when you're writing to the Romans, you say that Jesus is our Lord. That means that Caesar is no longer your Lord. And, of course, he is, uh, Jesus has given Paul the apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith, okay? We need to have faith, and we need to be obedient to that faith. We need to put our faith in Jesus. But look, Paul's gospel here, it tells us who Jesus is. He's not God. He is God's son. He's not the creator. He was someone who was born. He is a descendant of David, okay? He's a human being along those line, the line of, of David and the promises that are uh, made to David and his, his seed. He was raised from the dead. He was exalted to God's right hand. And Jesus demands the obedience of faith. Okay? So it's a possible strategy. Who is Jesus according to Paul's gospel? Okay? He is God's son, the descendant of David who is raised from the dead. And 2 Timothy 2.8, Paul says, uh, Remember, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. So according to the gospel message that people had to believe in order to be converts, you had to believe that Jesus was David's descendant. Again, a human being along David's line. Okay? And also risen from the dead. Okay? So you've got the kingdom there. You've got the identity of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus, according to my gospel. All those things are formally said in Romans 1, verse 5 verses. 
<clears throat> and that is uh, mentioned there in the theology of 2 Timothy. So, Paul's gospel required the converts to believe that Jesus was a descendant of David. This is what he would preach to people who didn't know anything at all about Judaism and Messianism and, and what the Messiah meant. A descendant of David is a human being, clearly distinct from God. Furthermore, a descendant of David did not literally pre-exist David. That makes sense. I did not live before my father. I'm not even the same age as my father. Every son and every daughter is younger in age, by definition, than their parents. <clears throat> okay. How about this? How did Jesus himself define God? Possible strategy. You could ask the question here. Now, what did Jesus have to say about God? How did Jesus define who God is? <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, surely, as followers of Christ, we would adopt his teachings on who God is, per the Great Commission. Remember the Great Commission? We're to make disciples, and we are to teach them to observe all the things that Jesus commanded. So, here are a few things that Jesus said about God, okay? So, collecting these passages and sharing them with your dialogue partner might be an effective strategy. <clears throat> Look what Jesus said here to the woman at the well. Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And I want you to kind of listen to the logic of this. Paul, or excuse me, Jesus. Jesus here says that we Jews worship what we know. Jesus agrees that the Jewish definition of whom to worship meaning God as the Father, is correct. Jesus does not disagree with what the Jews worship as the Father. He doesn't say, well, the Jews, they, they only believe that God was one person, but I, Jesus, I'm going to come along and tell you that actually God is a trinity. No, he actually agrees with what the Jews say, okay? He's agreeing with Jewish monotheism. We worship what we know. Salvation is from the Jews, okay? So Jesus is not coming into his ministry to change the definition of God. He's not. All right? He even says this in John 8, 54. Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. So when Jesus is talking with his dialogue partners, um, he, he draws on some common ground. He's like, look, we agree on who God is. He, singular pronoun, by the way, one person, who is described in the verse as my father, he is our God. The father is Jesus' God, and the father is the God of Jesus' dialogue partner, okay? And it's interesting here, Jesus says, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. That's not the kind of thing that someone who is God would say. If God wants to glorify himself, that glory would be everything. But Jesus glorifies himself, it's nothing, because God is the one that has to glorify him. And that God is the Father, and that understanding of God as the Father is something that Jesus agrees on, and he agrees with his dialogue partners. Jesus is not redefining who God is. John 20, 17, after the resurrection, Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. So clearly with Jesus' disciples... He understands that he and his disciples agree on who God is. That God is Jesus' father and is the father of his disciples. It's also Jesus' God and the God of his disciples, okay? So Jesus is not redefining who God is. God is the father and it's Jesus' God. Jesus agrees with his disciples on who God is. Namely, it's the father. And Jesus is not that God. Jesus is distinguished from that God, and he calls that God his God. Okay, um, here in Mark 12, 20, 29 through 32, uh, Jesus talks to the scribe, and he says, the foremost commandment is here, o Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay, and the scribe said to him, right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one, and there is no one else besides him. Mark 12, 29 through 32. Okay, I know he also talks about the, the, the commandment uh, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's equally as important. But here, 
Jesus is saying that the greatest commandment is that God, the Lord, is one, and the Jew with whom he's speaking agrees with him. Okay, Jesus is not redefining God. He's not saying actually God is not one, God is two or three. He agrees with him. Okay, uh, and to say that he is one, and by the way, uh, in, um, in English, we don't have a way to distinguish these sort of things. Like I could say, I could talk about the word one, and you don't know if it means one person or one thing. Okay, but in Greek, you can actually differentiate this. Okay, you could say that he is one with the, ma the masculine, and that means one person who is male. Okay, you could also say one thing, and it means something that is a, a thing that is not a person. Okay, here he uses the masculine in Greek. Okay, he is one person, not one thing, one person. There is no one else besides him, singular pronoun. We all know what that means. There is no one else besides him. He is one person. We don't need an army of theologians or rocket scientists to explain what that means. Okay, but Jesus agrees with the Jewish understanding of God being a single person, no one else beside him. Okay, and uh, probably the most powerful passage that you really need to commit to memory if you haven't already. John 17, 3, where he says, this is eternal life. This is the life of the age to come, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is really the theology of the entirety of the Gospel of John, is that there is only one true God, which is the Father that Jesus is praying to in this passage, and that only true God has sent and commissioned Jesus so that true God has empowered and authorized Jesus as the one, as the agent. <clears throat> okay? Jesus is distinct from the only true God. But look there. Jesus says, hey, look, this is not a divine suggestion. This is not religious good advice. He says, this is eternal life. It's very, very important. You don't want to get eternal life wrong. Okay? All right? And the eternal life is that they may know you. They need to know personally you, singular pronoun, and you have all these other singular words. V is singular in Greek. Only is singular in Greek. True is singular in Greek. And God is singular in Greek. And someone who is distinct from the only true God is Jesus Christ, whom the only true God has sent. Okay? It's an important topic when Jesus says, knowing someone as the only true God um, and Jesus Christ um, is eternal life. That makes it deeply important. Okay applications. So what are some things you can walk away with to help you to have some helpful conversations with other people regarding who God is and who Jesus is? Number one, we should take advantage of the opportunities God places before us to speak. God wants everyone to come to the knowledge of the truth regarding the one God and the human Christ Jesus who mediates between God and humanity. Jesus summoned us to teach others, and Paul recognized the need to have correct knowledge, to have correct knowledge accompany zeal. Okay? So, like, we're going to have opportunities to speak people. God's going to put them before us, and we need to take advantage of, of those opportunities. It's something that God wants, it's something that Christ wants, and it's something that Paul wanted. Number two, we need to be good listeners. Not good debaters, not good speakers. We need to be good listeners in order to hear where our dialogue partner is coming from because different approaches are needed depending on the circumstances. Jesus dealt with people differently depending on where they're at. There's also a reason why in order to be a good listener, it's probably not a good idea to have these conversations over social media, okay? Like, try to have them on the phone or have them in person or have them over video chat. Uh, but kind of typing to somebody, it's hard for me to hear somebody when I'm just reading their text. Uh, I can't see them. I can't see their nonverbal communication. I can't hear the emphasis that they're putting in certain words. I can't see body language. We really need, we need to become good listeners. Number three, for ongoing conversations, find a good balance between regular engagement and giving time for the subject to process, okay? You don't wanna have so much regular engagement that you never have the opportunity for your dialogue partner to actually think for themselves. You also don't wanna just never talk to them again and just assume that they're gonna figure things out on their own, okay? Continue to dialogue with them, disciple them, speak the truth to them, 
but give them some time to process things. Remember the three C's, courage, conviction, and compassion. If you want to put compassion first, that's fine, okay? Courage, conviction, and compassion. Number five, quickly transition a discussion to the Bible, okay? Quickly transition a discussion to the Bible. That way it's not just a bunch of opinions, or I believe, or I feel. Get everyone to have a Bible in front of them. And if possible, have your dialogue partner read the passages you want them to consider. That is very, very, I can't emphasize that enough. That is so powerful in getting people to think for themselves. Number six, consider visual aids as a way of getting the data in front of others, okay? I wrote out four verses in a hierarchy. That's been beneficial to, um, with me talking to people. It might be beneficial to you. And number seven, take time to prepare your presentation possibly using bulk examples from the teachings of Jesus or the preaching of Paul. I offered a couple of examples um, from things that Paul said, the way that Paul interacted with Gentiles, the way that Paul described Jesus, and the way that Jesus defined God, okay? But you need to ha have, take some time to prepare your, your presentation, okay? Because organization is going to be much more persuasive than sloppiness. All right. Um, that's what I have in regard to my presentation we can open things up here for some questions and comments. Uh, so if you have something you'd like to share, just raise your hand and we'll go ahead and call on you. Um, okay, John has his hand raised. It's actually Lisa. Yeah, I was just going to say that the thing that I found challenging with people hasn't been as much um, people seeing what you're talking about, because I found quite a few people that do. The thing that I found challenging is getting people to set, see and accept that it's something that they need to take a stand on and that they need to uh, not just hide and be like, well, this isn't really that important. I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna uh, um, sort of assimilate into the, you know, mainstream Christian, what uh, Christian, um, community, you know, church or whatever, because, you know, things start happening, like even in, in instances where, you know, we had somebody that did for a little bit, um, like in one instance, it was a single person and they started realizing, oh, it's going to be much harder for me to found, find a spouse and I want to really get married. So, you know, oh, I guess this isn't, you know, they start rationalizing that, this is going to be too difficult. I think they kind of in their mind start thinking this is going to make life difficult for me and I don't really want that. So they, um, we have a lot of that. John and I have a lot of that. We've had um, a lot of people that in our area where John has shared tr the truth with them, you know, he did this lunch for a long time that this guy that was, he was this guy that was coming to it um, the, the guys just kind of jokingly started naming it and calling it heretic huddle because it was the lunch where, you know, people could come and talk about controversial matters, you know, and John would share about, you know, who is God and who, who Jesus is and pretty much everybody there that came to that. And there were quite a number of people over some time, you know, would like see, you know, what he was saying and agree with that but uh, they just really were not willing to go. Um, well, you know, they're all have family members who are mainstream Christians or spouses or whatever, and they just weren't willing to, to take the risk that they're going to have persecution or trouble, I don't think, because of believing that and taking a stand on it. So, oh, wait, you're muted, Dustin. Okay. So um, what I, do, that's what I would want to understand better how to deal with is what do you do with that? Yeah. Um, well, it, it's interesting here that, that, that part of when Paul had to preach the gospel, notice that it's not just accepting God and Jesus. There's also repentance. There's also a change of mind and a change of behavior that involved with that. Uh, and Jesus talked about, hey, he, he, he taught about counting the cost. You have to count the cost of the decision that you're going to make. You have to understand that, okay? 
Uh, I, I know people and, and Valerie knows people that uh, are married and the two spouses have different understandings on who God is and who Jesus is. And it is hell for the children. It is not good. It, it is, it is like they, 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 they compromised on those sort of things. And, and now other people have to suffer. And the reality is it's like, it's not even real fellowship because the definition of fellowship biblically is commonality. Why would I go to a church if I believe something different from them? That's not commonality. And what is more important than having commonality on God and Jesus? Name me something more important than those things, like commonality on common music, on the, the coffee bar that you have. Like, that's more important for a lot of people these days. Um, so I, I would encourage people, I would say, look, like, it's, it's uh, you know, part of, the, the, part of Christianity is repenting. It means changing your behavior and you have to give things up. Um, and when Paul had to preach to these pagans, telling people that have lived their entire life worshiping multiple gods to give up all of them and to never go back to them again was a major, major, major life change. But that was a non-arguable um, like, like, like deal breaker. Like, like Paul would not budge on that. He would not have people in the church that would continue to be idolaters and he continually warned that those people uh, would not inherit the kingdom because that was a big change. It was part of the repentance that they need to have. And so um, if I'm telling this to somebody, uh, I'm, I'm encouraging them to, to count the cost and to understand what they're doing because uh, what they're doing is they're compromising and they're being cowardly. Um, and, I, you know, and, and the thing is, I, I try to be very, very careful in my presentation to not use the threat tactic. Okay, you could use it and it's, it's actually biblical, okay? You could say, hey, if you don't do these things or if you don't believe these things, there's going to be consequences on the day of judgment, okay? I could have done that, okay? Uh, but I'm, I'm showing that there are other ways you can go about doing those sort of things. But, um, you know, the Bible does warn against compromising behavior, especially when it comes to these sort of things. And so I think just letting people know those sort of things, uh, I mean, it's, it, they're difficult conversations and each person is is different. So... But that, that's also one of those things that people kind of need some time to, um, to realize. But I don't know. I, I found a lot of people that just, they just don't know where else to go. They're like, where can I go? Where can I go for fellowship? So thank you for sharing that. And I'm sure a lot of us can, uh, can relate to those sort of things. Maybe we were in that position. Okay, uh, lots of hands up. I'm going to go, uh, let me go, I don't know who's next. Um, I'm just going to go to Josiah. Um, I'm trying to make it brief. I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but um, I guess Christian would be kind of a perfect example, except I really, we really had an advantage because he was in the boys' home when I was staff there, the one I got asked to leave, and he was there when I got asked to leave, so I kind of had some credibility with him. Um, and so I, I guess what I would look for in the future for talking to people is a relationship as well. Uh, I know that's not always the case you need to share no matter what. Um, but anyway, that saying, he, it seems, I'm pretty sure God just really orchestrated the whole thing. So we really, the conversations we had were just what you laid out pretty much exactly. You know, I asked him what he believed about the gospel, about the kingdom, and just kind of understood what he was saying. And then we just talked about what the Bible said. He read, I didn't ask him to read a lot of verses, but we read two verses in Acts. And he was like, wait, he read them aloud. He's like, wait. <laughs> You know, that, that's what you're saying is, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's true. I, I haven't seen that before. And he cares about the Bible a lot. Um, he cares. He said, you know, some people believe Trinity. Some people believe all these different things. I just want to believe what the Bible says. And so I know that's, that's kind of a rare person already. Um, but I guess there's a perfect, there's a perfect example of what we're talking about that happened in short order, I guess, with the backup of a, a good relationship. Um, but I also had kind of a discussion question of, you know, I'm in the, I've for the past several months been super into the theological world and that's not in general. People don't think theologically a whole lot, they think about the lives that they're in. And so, um, maybe there's not a set thing that you to start conversations, but how have some people that have you know, been around longer, even just as a Christian in general, sharing faith. How do you bring just normal life to 
theological discussion because for me that dictates my whole life my whole the whole way i look at the world is through theology but that's not the average person so just kind of a discussion question yeah uh first of all welcome christian thanks for for joining us today and hopefully we haven't said anything today that's been offensive to you um we're happy to have you um you know I, I tend to find that uh, like if people are religious, naturally they're interested in God. Um, and, and you, you could talk about, Hey, there's, there's various world religions that all believe a lot of different things. How do you know what is right? How do you know what is wrong? Um, you can ask somebody why they think that they're right. Um, it, it really, I, I don't think there's a one size fits all. This is really one of those things where um, you want to talk to somebody you want to know what you want to share and where you want to lead them, but figure out where they're at, talk to them, you, you kind of develop that rapport and, and just kind of work with where they're at um, on things that they talk about. So just building that common ground, um, just being patient, taking time. Um, and like I said, it's, it's, it's really different for each person. It's different for, for, for a lot of people. So you know, I'm, I'm sure we can, Talk about that. Uh, I, I tell you what. Let's um, let, let me let me make sure I answer everybody's questions, and that that might be a good discussion topic for for once we're kind of off the camera. Um, but but I appreciate you raising that. I just want to make sure that I, I'm able to answer all the other questions that are here. So, okay, uh, I'm gonna go to Sean. And I'm gonna go to Dean. Good morning, everybody. So, um, Dustin, uh, yesterday. Um, you you told me you would be um would be teaching today um i appreciate it and i did invite um i did invite my my friend and or my uh, my acquaintance but um it doesn't look like um, she showed so um i don't think it's a, a matter of her um not wanting to show um i just need to to get back in contact with her but I also share that um, I <laughs> I invited my direct supervisor, my boss, to um, to fellow fellowship, and um, out of the blue on a Thursday one-on-one uh, -on -one call, she just asked me. I just want to know what church did you attend? And she lives in Charlotte, so we don't live in the same same city. But she asked, and um, I told her, you know, that I attend the fellowship. Um, and I said, um, I did attend a church, a Trinitarian church, but I don't believe in a Trinity anymore. It's just difficult for me to find um, a church home, but I was able to, um, to find um, a fellowship, a, a biblical Unitarian fellowship. And she said, oh, that's interesting. Then we moved on. And um, I, we didn't discuss it um, any further, but um, on Friday, um, I responded to an email um, from her. We talked about something else, and I just um, responded, oh, by the way, you're welcome to join us. We have great teaching. Um, you know, send me a text, and I'll give you the link. And I gave her my phone number, and she didn't um, um, respond to, um, to that. So um, just some background. My question is, this is really a question, um, I don't want it to be, it was weird for me to, and I'm sorry I'm saying this, but um, this is how I felt, that it felt weird to, um, to, to ask her in that, that way, to invite her in that way, and, um, you know, in the environment that we're in, I mean, she's my boss, and I'm fairly new to the job, and um, so I, I don't know how to, um, to approach it again or even if I should. Uh, so that's, that's, that's my question. Should I leave it up to her or should I approach it again? And I don't want to make our relationship um, weird because I don't want to um, bother her as you, as you, as you said. So. Yeah, it's, it's tricky because um, there, there are a lot of those topics that you're really not even allowed to talk about in a lot of workplaces. Uh, so I, I think it's interesting that a supervisor initiated the conversation with you. And for me, that, that, I think that's the key, is that she showed some initiative in regard to that. 
Um, and so maybe you could ask her like, hey, why, why did you ask me that question? Like, or, or maybe she was just being nice. Mm -hmm. Maybe she was interested. Um, maybe she is a person of, of religion uh, or a religious person. Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe asking her why she asked that question um, could get the conversation to go a little bit further. Um, mm -hmm. You could also, you could just say kind of what you told me and say, hey, um, I, I'm, I, I'd like to have conversations like this with you, but I want to respect the work environment and the, uh, the employer employee relationship. Um, and you could ask her like, you know, um, if, if this is a conversation you would like to have, um, could we have it outside of work maybe? Mm -hmm. Um, that way you're not potentially doing something that could get you in trouble. Um, but that way you're, you're just, you're just, you're not, you're not going into a conversation. You're just asking her what she is comfortable with. And you know what, if she's comfortable having a conversation, she'll let you know. If she's not having a, uh, she's not comfortable having a conversation, she'll let you know. Okay. I mean, that, that would just be my advice. Thank you. I'm actually right in this now. I appreciate you guys that very much. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Okay, Dean. Uh, some really interesting points I'm hearing. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, the Trinit uh, Trinitarian doctrine is idolatry because it dishonors God and his son. But yeah, every situation when you're dealing with people is going to be different. And um, you do have to develop a, a relationship. I think in a lot of cases, a certain amount of rapport with that person, finding out what they believe and, and how you can approach that. Um, I, you know, every situation is different, and I, there's just no cut answer for each one. Um, it It is important that we take a stand on what we believe and what we know is true from, from Scripture. But when you're dealing with people, you have to find out where they're coming from. You, have to, you do have to be a good listener, and uh, you just have to take it from there. Um, Sometimes it's important to be flat out with the truth, and sometimes it's you have to you have to listen. It just depends on the individual. And if there's no interest, uh, that's very important. If there's no interest, man, just go on because there are other people that are, that will listen. Um, we're not called to badger people. We're not called to back down either, uh, but we are to walk in love and we are to consider, you know, it's a really important topic because, you know, we, we for over what, 17, 1800 years, that Trinitarian doctrine has been promoted among Christians. And that's, that's like Paul talking to the, you know, the people, uh, in in uh, Athens and other places like that, who had all these other gods, they're so ingrained in that, and it's really a, a challenge to bring forth. I think your point on having them read the scripture for themselves out loud, you know, pointing it out, letting them see the very clear uh, verses, is a very good point. And you know, how can you deny that? Um, and then you have, you have to allow people time to consider, to mull this over. You know, it's the same thing with John uh, Truett, who, what, three years ago or more, talking about the salvation issue with me. And generally speaking, uh, if I hear truth, I can latch on to it pretty quickly. But, you know, I had been taught on the once saved, always saved thing. Uh, and I evangelized with that, teaching other people that um, for 40 years. <laughs> uh, but then when I saw how these verses that I read before, and they never really made sense, I had to mull it over. It didn't take too, off, uh, too long of a time for me to consider that and realize, yeah, that's the truth. You've got to remain faithful. You have, God requires faithfulness. You can't just... Uh, get born again and do anything you 
darn well please and, and think that you're going to enter the kingdom. It doesn't fit with scripture. But I had to see that clearly and denounce the, um, the fact that, well, this is what I was taught before. And so that's what I held on to for 40 years. But we got people that are Trinitarians that have been believing this for a long, long time. And it's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging for them to take a stand. We have to take the stand where we are, but we have to use it wisely and depending on where people are at. Um, everybody's different and our approach is gonna be different depending on the person and the situation. Very good points, thank you, <clears throat> thank you. Okay, uh, go to the Trig household and then I'm gonna to go to Tony. Hey, um, yeah, very good stuff. Uh, the only thing that comes to my mind, uh, you know, kind of in light of what Dean is uh, re, uh, whatever. Um, one thing I always think of in this sort of situation is that since we can't know what's inside somebody's head and we, we have to spend time with them to learn how they're approaching the thing and what their history is, it, I always come back to the the passage in Nehemiah chapter two, where, you know, he's in a situation with the king and the king, you know, says, what is it that you want? And then it just shows, which has to be this kind of momentary interpersonal relationship thing between Nehemiah and God, where he, you know, prayed to the God of heaven and then he answered, right? And so, so my mindset is that it's always very good to have wise strategies like the ones that you shared, Dustin, but we always have to combine that with this relationship with God where he knows things that we, can we take her somewhere else? Where he knows things that we don't. And so we can tap into that in the moment and, you know, ideally hear something from him that maybe we didn't think of that maybe is exactly what needs to be said or displayed or whatever in the moment to kind of touch that person's heart or, or bring about God's will, you know? Yeah, good point. I'm not uh, advocating that we don't listen to God. Um, I think it, it's, a, it's a combination, it's a both and. <clears throat> uh, having no preparation and just kind of hoping that God's gonna lead you without taking the time to prepare or, or to know the gospel or to, you know, that, I don't know if that's going to do well, but who knows, you know, so like yeah, I said, these are, these are just suggested tips and strategies. I've got some passages in there. I've got some scriptural backing for some of them, but um, my main goal is, is just to encourage us to have those conversations with people. And, um, you know, I'm sure someone will thank us later for it. So yeah, good point. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Okay, Tony. Oh, uh, thanks again, uh, Dustin. I um, appreciate the, the tips and the strategy. Um, I've used a good bit of those. I guess what I'm, what I'm finding in my life is it's, it's not always a happy path, unfortunately. You know, you can share these truths um, with someone um, lovingly and, um, you know, scripturally, and um, they are – you know, so bent and so um, hoodwinked on, they see it differently. And, and I guess is what I'm saying is that it's, you got to be prepared for um, the rejection or the, the, the um, talk to the hand scenario. Right. And um, it's a bummer because especially when you're enthusiastic and excited to learn these wonderful truths, it reminds me when I got saved, you know, I was very vocal, very, um, you know, hey, I, I just, I got saved. I mean, I, I, I met my creator my, and, and I, I, my sins were forgiven and um, I was born again. I was born from above and it was a wonderful time and I shared and I, and I was completely heartfelt. And, um, you know, it's kind of like I was, once I was blind, now I could see. I didn't know a lot of scripture, but who does when they're saved, right? And nonetheless, this is. 
I liken this whole drop in the Trinity um, ideology almost in that in that arena of, of being um, saved again because it's it was such an explosion of a uh, of realization and, and it was connecting the dots in a lot of ways and um but unfortunately you know it's just I, I, your strategies are cool really I, I mean that honestly and heartfelt um it's just I, I guess we uh, the execution aspect is it doesn't always have a happy path unfortunately and i guess we got to just be prepared to keep punching away i mean not literally but um you know just keep uh like you said in your revelation um statement perseverance and it's not always easy i want to i want to lay low sometimes because it's you know constantly uh you know um trying to um you know send to get the message across or um, appeal to um, logic or can you see this and you know but I, I here's the and the other aspect is that I didn't no one taught me this you know I told you my story and it was me looking and searching the scriptures so God opened my mind the father opened up my mind so I could see this and um, God I, I, I don't know how to get around that fact that he's got to do the same to the people I'm talking to but yet we have to be diligent to to tell people about these things, even though it's going to be talking to a, a wall. So I don't know. That's the that's the reality I inter- engage with in my life, in my almost one year of, of realizing these things. So uh, I, I I just I appreciate the tips and you know and they're definitely cool. I'll definitely relook at the video and all, but that that's what I'm finding. It's just you may have an awesome, convincing, can't you see that in First Timothy 2, 5, 2, 15 or 2, 5, for there's one God and one media between God and man, man, Christ. I mean, bam, 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 it says it right there. But, no, nope, they see it differently, and they got other scriptures. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, I think with, with the variety of the doctrines that we hold, um, it's, it, it's, just difficult to have conversations with, with people. Um, it, it needs to be successful, but there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of factors that are involved it, with that. Um, you know, people talk about how just some people, they just genuinely and sincerely, they just see the evidence going another direction. Okay. They just, yeah. two people look at a passage, they just read it differently. Okay. That, that happens in our group. Like I get that. Um, you know, we weigh different things differently. Um, some people, they just, they don't want to listen to something. Some people have been told that this particular doctrine um, is a cult doctrine. That's just what they've been told. Um, you know, some people, they don't want to count the cost. Some people, they won't accept something because they don't want to admit that their family members who also believe it are wrong. Um, yeah. there's, I mean, there's just so many things in there. Uh, and, they, and they do take time. I'll, I'll give you, just as you talk about the revelation thing, um, you know, I've, I've been convinced of, of my reading of Revelation for a decade now. Um, and I've tried to teach it a, a few times and I've learned the hard way that that's one of those things that it takes people a lot of time to, to digest. Um, and uh, when, when I first presented my kind of overall view, um, let's just say there, there are some people even among us right now that were not convinced and thought I was crazy. Um, many of them have come along. Uh, eventually but it i mean we've been working on that thing for almost two years um we're not even done we're just like two-thirds of the way done and so i've had to learn to be very slow and very patient and just and realize that um that ingrained teaching for people is sometimes very difficult to undo or or it's it's very time consuming If, if it's going to happen it's very time consuming so um you know I, I can't just yell at somebody and be like, hey, this is the way it is. Because it's, it's not until they decide for themselves that that's the way it is that they're going to be convinced. They're not going to be convinced for me yelling at them. Yeah, that's that's a good point because it's almost like you got to got to remove the poor teaching or the myths or the untruths. And then you got to replace all that, that cavity that you just pulled out the root with truth. Yeah. And then but, but we got to be willing and accepting. Yeah. So. Appreciate it. Yeah. I, I, I like, I like your story in particular because 
you heard someone make kind of an off a cuff statement in public that, oh, the Trinity's not true. And it was just that little off comment that I don't even think was directed at you in particular that got you thinking, oh, is the Trinity not true? Um, and I think a lot of people would think, oh, we shouldn't make those sort of comments because those comments aren't effective. Well, you're here proof because that comment, those sort of comments could be effective. Um, so let's, let's not sit there and deny and say, well, uh, something might not work. Um, you never know. You, know. you never know what you say that's going to be uh, effective with somebody. So, okay. Um, Julie has her hand raised. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. I miss you all. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I was, you know, Dean had a really good point about the things that he said. Everybody's, it's just been great. And I know Tony's kind of in a situation that's maybe a little different than some of us, but I think when you're talking to somebody about this, um, one thing we have to always remember is that, you know, when you're talking to them, like, like, Tony said, God's got to be in that situation. He's got to open that person's heart and we can't take it personal. I mean, I, I know me, I take it personal. It's like, oh my gosh, can't you get this? It's like, there it is in front of you, you know, and you just can't believe they can't understand. And so it gets real personal, you know, but I try to keep that out of it and just try to be loving about it. And, um, you know, just say, hey, well, you know, you just have to figure it out yourself but you really need to take a serious look at this, you know, but I think try to keep it from being so personal and get offended about it. Cause that's what my problem sometimes is. I take it real personal and it's not personal, you know? So that's it. <clears throat> yeah, it, it could be personal. I mean, rejecting Jesus' message is rejecting Jesus. Um, you know, which is ultimately rejecting God who sent Jesus. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I, I get that. And that's difficult to do as well. Um, because the, the things that we try to share is an extension of who we are. I just want to say, share one more thing real quick. And it's the fact that we want to love God and we want to love our Lord Jesus Christ first and foremost. And with that, with that attitude, that's why we present the truth to people because we want to love them too. We want them to be blessed. We want them to know the truth. And so this has, has got to be our motivation. Our motivation is because we love God, we love the Lord Jesus Christ, and we love others. Yep, very good points. Very good. Uh, anybody else have anything they wanted to add? I was just going to say that that after what I said a minute ago, you know, thinking about it more, neither John or I understood uh, as much about how to um, show people wh why it's seriously important um, in the past. We didn't, it's, it's only been a more recent development that we were understood and we're better able and equipped to explain to people why it's really a serious issue and why it's um, you know potentially a salvific issue um, neither one of us um, actually I had my 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 inklings about second John before but I would kind of get shot down when I would bring up second John you know as because people at least from from our background didn't really get taught or understand you know, Second John and what it's saying, but um, so you know, we did the best we could at the time. Um, you know, for me, um, you know, the thing that I saw instantly, and what would bring up with people is that does it not seem um, kind of an idolatrous thing to you that we're supposed to, you know, worship the Father God only? He's the one true God in in the position of being the Creator and the one true God of uh, and creator of everything and if you are putting Jesus in his place and giving you know the worship that's due him that was the the one thing that you know I I would was able to share but um, because of uh, you know all the things that we've been learning in fellowship things that that Dustin and and others as well have brought to you know our understanding 
we're I think we're a lot better equipped now to be able to to show people why it's really really an important thing and um, and answer them well when they say, well, practically speaking, what difference does it make? Because that's the, the question that a lot of people have asked. Yeah, um, I've had people ask me that question and I'm not always convinced that they're asking that question because they really want to know. I think they're asking that question kind of as a, so what? Um, you know, not always, but but sometimes that's the way it is. And, and, and you know, we, 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 we make these videos available for people. They're all on the website um, and a nice organized little tab for people to look at. They can go check out for themselves. Um, you know, so you could, if you, if you don't feel comfortable having a conversation on a particular topic, you could share a, a teaching video with them. Uh, and that helps a lot. There are a lot of people that have um, really come to know, come to know true. There are a lot of people that, that are here right now because they start, they first started watching some of the teachings and now they're here because of that. So, um, you know, take advantage of the opportunities you have. Yeah. So anyway, I hope this has been an encouraging video to help you to have those important conversations uh, about the human Jesus and the one God. And uh, if you believe those things, we'd love to have you in fellowship. If you don't have any uh, Christian church near you, you can check out the description in the uh, in the video's description below and get in touch with us and uh, we'd love to meet you. So thank you so much for watching.